theme of forgiveness. Uh, I think, I've got to be careful here, I think there's probably sometimes we can, with those that habitually go to church, there'll be some themes that can particularly relate and there'll be others that less so for some of us. And, and that, that's fine because that's, that we're human. But what, the more I thought about it this week, that theme of forgiveness, we, we all relate to it. And actually unforgiveness. We, we all will relate to this theme. We'll all get it. And uh, we'll all be somewhere on a journey that, that where we've experienced forgiveness and where we've given, provided forgiveness to a greater or lesser extent. And the other thing I'll just say, and this is not to make things sound complicated or profound, I have no idea uh, what might be particular challenges for anybody here on this theme. So I was never contacted and says, Pete, come and speak about forgiveness because we've got a real problem. <laughs> I, I have no idea. It's, uh, whilst I wouldn't, I'd, ref, I, I'd avoid the word random, I think it's a right message for today. But if there's something that is particularly salient for you, uh, that will take that as God speaking to you. Speak to God about that rather than Pete knows something about X individual. And, uh, and, and this is a message for that individual. Not so. It's a general message on forgiveness. Um, I've put a few things together to get us thinking about that theme of forgiveness. And you can shout out why you think I've put somebody on what you're going to see. Funny enough, this was the first person that came into my head when I was just thinking. Forgiveness. Nelson Mandela, why would I put him on there? The theme of forgiveness. Who wants to shout out? 29 years in prison. 29 years in prison. Someone who, uh, uh, someone who had so much to give and uh, arguably at his peak and was put in prison for a prolonged period of time. Speaking out against an, uh, something that was unjust. And yet, when he came to the UK as, as president and a former president and travelled around the world, you never saw any of that bitterness. And I know we didn't see him in depth, but you never saw it. You always saw someone who was looking to the future. I have no idea what his relationship is with the God that we worship. No idea. But what I do believe is that God qualities are in people. That's what the Bible says. Man is made in God's image. And whilst, whilst we're never going to perfectly reflect it, none of us, there's people who can really reveal to you a quality that, that is so rich, it's a challenge to us. Nelson Mandela, so that's why I put him up, someone who experienced huge injustice. You never, you, never, you never saw the bitterness, certainly not publicly. Who knows that picture? I'd not seen that one for a long time. It's really quite a famous one, isn't it? Uh, the little girl, Vietnam, where napalm had just been dropped and so actually th those children, their skin's burning. They're not just running away from a scary noise. And that girl, Kim, uh, I saw an interview with her a few years ago now. She's a US citizen. And she's, she's set up a foundation that looks at forgiveness and reconciliation. It's really uh, Kim Pook. Um, you can read quite a lot about it. And she gives incredibly moving uh, stories and testimonies of how that foundation has done something. And that's, again, I, where would I say God's in that or what she's experienced? I don't know. But there's an incredible freedom that someone who experienced something so horrific is able to, to show forgiveness and work on forgiveness. Let me show you another one. Mm, a little bit harder, but probably not for you guys. Koi Ten Boom. Why did I put her up? She, she, she was in prison. Somebody... Sister died. So she, this was uh, somebody who, um, Dutch woman, who you can go to her house actually if you ever, you can ask me where it is. I had the privilege of going there. Well, I, I stumbled across it. I'm that daft. I was traveling through Holland and there's, there's a town called Harlem. It's a, it's a, a tram trip from uh, Amsterdam. And you can go to the house that is referred to as the hiding place uh, from that famous book and the movie that was made. Koi Ten Boom lived well on to uh, elderly age and was, uh, was a Dutch person who took pity on Jews who were escaping from the Nazis. 
and ended up going to a concentration camp herself and, and, and lost a number of family members, including her sister, who she was very close to. And she survived Ravensbrück camp. But uh, in some ways had every right to be bitter and angry. Every right, but not so. She spent the rest of her life, 50-odd years after the war, going around the world, speaking about reconciliation and forgiveness. And there's a wonderful true story. She, went to Ger she was in Germany in 1947, so that's not long after when that country was, frankly, in ruins, and uh, given, given a talk to Christians, and a guard from Ravensbrook came up and spoke to her and says, um, I, I was a guard at Ravensbrook. I don't remember you. I don't remember your sister. But I remember how wicked that place was and that I was part of it, and I'm asking for your forgiveness. The story goes, he put his hand out, and she said it was the hardest thing I did. But she prayed to God, I can put my hand out, I'm not sure I can forgive. And she put her hand up and she said she, she felt an electric current go through her of God's love she'd never experienced before. And that's, that God had become a Christian. And it's a remarkable thing where, where God empowered forgiveness. There's a fun one. Why did I put him up? I'm not sure he had a haircut like that. But, uh. Joseph. Joseph. Who, Joseph, who did he need to forgive? It's actually... It's actually quite a, li quite a list, you know? In a f see, I th not getting overcomplicated, I thought he had to, he had to forgive his dad a little bit because kind of his dad started it uh, by giving him that coat. But he had to forgive his brothers. And he ends up in Egypt and he had to forgive uh, Potiphar and Potiphar's household, his Potiphar's wife. He had to forgive uh, the, the, the baker and the butler. You remember that? They forgot him. He's just continuous over, over like probably a 12, 15 year period of where's God in all this? And yet, he, he, when you read scripture, there's never been any doubt, never any doubt that God had a grip, even though the injustices were ridiculous uh, for Joseph. So I put that one up. Um, I know you're not Roman Catholic, you guys, but uh, <laughs> Pope John Paul II, who was, uh, who was a very popular pope uh, for, for over 25 years or so. This is a remarkable picture. He's shaking hands with the guy who shot him. And uh, it was, uh, from memory, sort of around about the early 80s. And uh, it was a, a terrorist who shot him, shot, fired four bullets, two of them went in the Pope. And even in the Pope being, being given emergency treatment in the ambulance, he said, I forgive him. And, and it, there's a remarkable thing of a God quality coming out in a human being that actually, uh, sometime later, upon full recovery, he met that person. That's, it's an overwhelming message of forgiveness when somebody's tried to kill you. So as we're looking at uh, the, 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 um, the, the themes of forgiveness and what we can relate to and what we can see, I've said we all need to be forgiven and we all need to forgive. These are some pictures I put up of, do you know how far our gap can be between knowing we should and the hurt and the pain that makes it incredibly difficult. And that's that caveat that I say, it's a, one of these things that we can say and we can sing because we've experienced forgiveness and yet it can be so difficult when we see some injustices and some pain that stays with people for their life. And I just picked out pictures that are relatively from, from different news sources. And that one happens to be Ukraine, where something you can't control or influence has just led to that level of destruction and that level of disruption to a person's individual life. And the things that are valuable and important to them has just evaporated away. And yet, forgiveness is called for. I've put that one up. That was a Matt, we, you've probably forgotten that one, but you remember Equitable Life, that scheme for, that was in place for 200 years and did lots of people's pensions and stuff like that, over-promised and frankly was poorly led, poorly managed, and people's pensions uh, 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 was unable to fulfil its promises. But we can see that in numerous different other places where we've put trust in something, we've depended on something and not been looked after and not treated well as a result, and it's gone on and on and on for years. The equitable life scandal, it was called. 
people, where, where there's an increase in amount of fraud and things like that. We, we would call it theft, IT theft, personal data, scams, stuff like that. It, how can we forgive if we've experienced that, where people's abuse does? And, 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 we, and, it, and, it's almost, and it's almost impersonal. You don't even know. You never get to see or meet. I put that one up for a laugh. That'll make you smile. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of... This one, again, it just, it just goes against our natural senses, doesn't it? That somebody... Oh, I, I, I'll cheat. I'll cheat. I'll find a way to cut a corner. I'll not put in the hard work. We see things like that, and you just think, that's a... Oh, you never forgive someone who does that. Well, pollution and decisions that are being made, often motivated by finance and money and, and, and empire building and the people who perhaps pay the most and, and are most affected and most harmed are the people that are li least the beneficiaries of it. Trust? No, I think that's possibly the one where we get most bruised. Trust and relationships. It'd be a relationships within our family, <coughs> It can be relationships within our wider family. It can be relationships at work. It can be relationships in the church where we can be incredibly bruised from that relationship. And Roger prayed it at the beginning, that reconciliation, that we can have a right relationship with God. We can have a right relationship with each other. But that's often where we've been most close to people, most trusting. And it's bitten us. We've been harmed. And that can be a really, really difficult journey to forgive. Put that one on there. 33 die without justice in the post office scandal. There's another one. How, how, do, you, how, how do you feel about that if it was a family member of yours that was just, they, they went off to prison because the, 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 the leaders wouldn't admit there's a problem. It must be you're doing fraud. And it was subsequently massively covered up scandal. And people who never saw justice, how do you forgive? acts of terrorism in that case major act of terrorism sometimes a huge loss of life how do you forgive that when that all seems so pointless and so random the people who were victims as is often the case with terrorism so those are ones that I just put up that makes us think about for, uh, forgiveness you know I pick up that one on relationships isn't it quite remarkable that in some ways in the bible that when it all started going wrong it's that relationships, Adam and Eve, right at the beginning. And, and the level of trust and the level of blame and then the relationship with God and falling out and how that was such a thing. You know, the other thing, we'll come back to it uh, in the second half, but we have a temptation, it's quite human actually, I said we have a temptation to it, it's something that we do. When we've been wronged, we, we often grade it We'll grade it on its significance. And we'll, we'll, that's what you'll do in a criminal court, and there's nothing wrong with that. In a criminal court, you, the sentence, the punishment, if somebody's found guilty, the punishment will be proportionate to the impact. That's why you bring in a thing called a victim impact statements in, in, in now in modern trials. But we will approach our forgiveness like that. Oh, I could, I could never forgive that person for doing that. We'll put a grade on it, a significance on it. We'll sometimes put a condition on it that if the person's sorry, if, if there's remorse. Now, again, a criminal court can work that way. That will affect the sentence. But we're not called to do that as Christians and as followers of Christ. It's not on condition of remorse. And it's not to have a reservation either a reservation being well i'll forgive you but i won't forgive you next time you know and it's very natural to add that wow you've gone and done it again and i forgave you last time and that's it it's gone condition of remorse you can't be sorry you've done it again and so we can become so entangled and you can see now why forgiveness is so hard to do because all those natural tendencies on the significance of it whether the person's sorry or not affects us Wonderful passage in scripture. God demonstrates his own love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Didn't wait for us to be remorseful. Didn't wait, didn't, didn't, wasn't conditional, 
that it was for some people and not for some others. When we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. When we were God's enemies. There's that song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him. All the initiation, all the starting was by God. It wasn't us meeting in the middle, which is what we often interpret forgiveness as. Somebody says, sorry, I'll put my hand out, they'll put their hand out. When we were God's enemies, we had that opportunity for reconciliation. Just when we're looking at uh, forgiveness, you know when I talked about that Koi Ten Boom, I should have read up on it a bit more, when she put her hand out. When we're looking, when we say sorry to people at those times when we need to, we can't guarantee their acceptance, but we can say sorry. And that's what we're called to do in the Bible. We're called, I I can't make someone forgive me, but I can ask for forgiveness. I can say sorry. There's a flip side to that too, that I can choose to forgive people even if they don't accept they've done anything wrong. How hard is that when you stop and think about it? That somebody's harmed me or my family, but they won't accept they've done anything wrong. They don't see that they need forgiveness. There's not much I can do about that. They're not going to have an argument about why they need forgiveness. But that will be something that we'll look at perhaps, and ponder that we can, we're called to do things and um, even if it's not, we can't control the outcome. Let me just finish this little bit on one other thing. And it's not, it, it's, it, this, is, this is where scriptural truth can be seen so in a, just a conventional society. If you go into medical research, they will show, it's medically proven, that the inability to forgive causes health problems. It, it, there's, there's shed loads of research on that. Anxiety, low mood, depression, high blood pressure, uh, stresses, heart disease. That's not to say if we've got those things, it's because we're harboring unforgiveness. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's an over-representation. Indeed, you can read about it in medicine where it's called, there's a prisoner, a prison of unforgiveness. You can be so bound up that it's actually robbing your life, the prison of unforgiveness. Recognised in medical uh, fields, it, that unforgiveness can be a dis-ease. When I say to you a disease, we're thinking of an infection or something like that, but it's dis-ease. Your, your system has no ease, because it's dis-ease. And that's what unforgiveness can be. Uh, I'm going to read I read Romans to you. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians, then probably I'll come back and start on this one again. I really liked how we started our service, that importance of reconciliation. Wonderful passage, 2 Corinthians 5. Read this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God initiated it when we were God's enemies and has given us reconciliation through Christ. And we are called to a ministry of reconciliation. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Four times the word reconciliation comes in. If we have no forgiveness, we cannot have reconciliation. We can't have a relationship. Not possible, not a functional relationship. So we're going to come back to that a little bit later in our service. But as we think about those people, uh, some of whom experience God's blessing hugely, others who just reflect some of God's kindness and some of God's characteristics in that theme of forgiveness. Thank you, Roger. And Charlie then, somebody come to his senses and thought, What have I done? What have I done? Thank you, folks. Thank you, Vera.
want to pick up the, well, what was the biblical version of that, was, um, or the, but the principles are the same. It's Matthew 18. It's one of the parables Jesus told. And it's one of, I, for me, I think it's the most challenging when someone who was shown almost infinite mercy and understanding was unable to replicate that and show that to someone else where they had the power to do so. There was a huge, it was an unpayable debt as we saw acted out. And in the parable with Jesus, there was an unpayable debt. The person pleaded for mercy and the king showed mercy. The interesting thing about the one in the, in, in the, in the, in the parable is that the debt, the debt didn't disappear. It was just taken off the person who couldn't pay it. It didn't magically create the money somewhere else. Somebody else shouldered that debt. Somebody else took it. And somebody met that debt through, the, through other means. But it, it, it wasn't erased. It was only erased for that person that pleaded for mercy. And so, uh, actually, the challenge in the parable is Jesus says, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. You're expected to show mercy as you have been shown mercy. I'm going to put up, um, going to put up the passage for us, Kin. That would be helpful, the Ephesians 1, if we could. I'm going to look at this passage just for the next 10 minutes or so. There are spoilt for choice in Scripture where we could look at forgiveness. We could have looked at uh, Joseph's life itself, but we could look at so many. But I picked this one in particular. This is from the message version, and we'll be keeping it up for the next few minutes. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, Jesus, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds, all the things we've done. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. No conditions, none of those reservations that I mentioned earlier. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. He set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him. Everything in the deepest heaven, everything on planet Earth. That is Paul right into his church, in uh, the church he was familiar with in Ephesus, and spelling out those truths. He introduces us to a way of knowing that we are free and equipping us, really, picking up that Koi Ten Boom analogy of being able to stick our hand out and him provide the power. We do our bit, but him provide the power. Here I'm going to just pick out a few words. He thought of everything. When I was looking at this, I go, funny enough, I was contacted by someone, this is a true story, I was contacted by somebody this week, and they said, it's somebody I worked with a few years ago, and uh, kept in touch with, but she got in touch with me this week, says, Pete, I've seen a job come up, um, I've seen a job come up, uh, and I'm thinking of applying for it, have you got any tips? And uh, so I sent her an email back uh, just a couple of days ago. And one of the things I put on it, I said, this job requires project management skills. If you don't have any, do some research beforehand so you, you can at least talk, talk, like you know what you're, <laughs> talk like you know what you're on about. That's a terrible thing to say. <laughs> Give the impression you know what needs to be done. But, and then, of course, you can formally get some training. That's what you should ask for. As I was looking at this passage, I'm thinking, it's perfect project management, this is. I should have sent her this, Ephesians 1. He thought of everything. You know when projects go wrong, it's because you don't anticipate the things that could get, there's no risk register. You don't anticipate, you don't fully, it's too much based on optimism, a bit like our drama. There's some land, it's pasture land, but I think it will be good for developing. So therefore, it'll infl the f price will be inflated 10 times because it be now becomes far more asset value. But actually, it wasn't able to be developed in our drama. So it was money wasted. And so in God's plan of reconciliation, in his rescue of us, he thought of everything. He thought of everything. Picking up the next bit, he provided for everything. So there's your perfect project management. Thought of everything, the, what has to be achieved, the scenarios, the risks and then provided for everything 
we could possibly need. Not just, not just scraping about a few resources, but providing everything. If it was a house building project, the whole thing from the foundational, the, from the architecture, architect right through the whole project, everything we could possibly need to have that house that was safe and secure. You know the other wonderful thing in this? Letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. God revealed to us, chose to, didn't have to, chose to involve us. There's reconciliation and inclusion. Chose to let us in on the plans he took such delight in making. God has a plan of rescue. And he's involved us or shared with us those plans right from start at Adam and Eve, Genesis 1. And read all the way through. And every signpost, every prophet, every story in Scripture, all pointing towards him, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. I'm calling you to be my people. I want a relationship with you. I am fathered by the true and living God. We were singing. I'm calling you to be children of me, adopting you into my family. The plans he took such delight in making a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him. Everything in deepest heaven. The plan's still going. We've heard about it. We've prayed about it. The ascension, Christ going back, and was Christ, before Christ went back, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me. There's the plan in fulfilment. And completion. So even today when we're saying that God will work with us, God will be with us, God will equip us to forgive, that's not the end uh, uh, for us to keep sort of stumbling and bumbling around trying to become better at forgiving because the actual long-term plan is we'll be living with him perfectly in paradise because of the sacrifice of the Messiah. There's God initiating that truth for God so loved the world he gave his only son. Not because we were crying out. He loved the world. He gave his son. When we were God's enemies, God demonstrated his own love for us. Christ died for us. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. What did he say when he was on that cross? Father, forgive them. That forgiveness that comes all the way through that passage. As he was experiencing injustice that I can't even find a word to to say was undeserved. There's not a word we've got that would sufficiently capture it. That someone who was perfect and blameless took all the punishment that Pete should have got and all the people here and all the people before us and the people that will be coming after us as part of that long-range plan because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out and he prayed, forgive them. And as a result of that sacrifice, we are free people, second line, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds. I think it was Corrie ten Boom who used to have that phrase, hey, you've thrown, thrown all the penalties, the punishment, the misdeeds into the sea and put up a sign saying no fishing. I think it was her that said it. It's a phrase that you've probably heard. But the Bible says Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, is how far he has removed our transgressions, the penalties and the punishments, our, beha- our misdeeds, as far as the east is from the west. Koi Ten Moon says, chuck it in the deepest sea, put up a sign, no fishing. What are we free from? free of the penalties, punishment, and all our... Did. Not just barely free, abundantly free. Well, we can be free from guilt because of things we've done that we've needed forgiveness for, and it's still haunting us. We can be free of blame. We can be free of condemnation. We heard that one in our opening prayer. We can be free from condemnation, that one going blame. We can be free from seeking revenge. Someone who's wounded us so badly, we are hoping they get their comeuppance. That's revenge. And it's God's job to ensure there's justice, not ours, to create it and engineer circumstances and situations where we can be happy when someone's uh, spectacularly crashed. We can be free from the prison 
of unforgiveness that can hold us so tightly and bound us. We can be free of those circumstances. We are absolutely free, abundantly free. Not partly free, abundantly free. One thing I've not mentioned, and I think it's important just to give a nod in that direction. I mentioned about forgiving others, forgiving companies, forgiving politicians, forgiving circumstances that can harm us. Forgiving ourselves. Do you know, that's, that can sometimes be massively underestimated or underappreciated, where there's people who... Um, do you know what? I've, 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 made, I've made mistakes. That's not supposed to sound a surprise. I've made mistakes that still bug me. I, a little bit of a perfectionist, believe it or not, and, it, and, it, and it, you, it can haunt you. Why didn't I say something different? Why didn't I plan that differently? Why didn't I, why didn't I do that? And, and the reality is you have to move on. You're abundantly free. You have to. And you have to forgive yourself. And s often it's a trivial, well, it's seemingly trivial, because nobody else is worried about it. You're not asking for any forgiveness. It's bugging you. Because you, you, never, you, never, you never did what you wanted to do or you never achieved what you were planning to do. That abundantly free, that forgiveness is... It, it is our license to forgive ourselves. If God says we're forgiven, we're forgiven. And that's the end of it. And we can't be, we can't be plagued with some mistake we made 30 years ago or 30 minutes ago. It's gone. And we have to take God's message and accept it, that we are reconciled with him. And that's our calling. It's a good theme, isn't it? It's a hard one. Uh, but... Thinking of that passage, give yourself a little bit of homework tonight or in the week ahead. Genesis 37 to 45, the story of Joseph and all the injustices that, that seemingly didn't trip him up. Paul and Silas in the prison, in, uh, unjustly, as Roman citizens in Acts 16, I think it is. And then, and, you know, read, read some of these passages that are about forgiveness that can challenge us. Joseph will be a good one that I'd encourage you to read. Let's wrap our part up now with a prayer. I'd like to lead us in a prayer before we move to our next song. And I'll, I'll actually, I'm going to finish on the Lord's Prayer. And I'm going to pause on that sentence. Forgive us our sins as, as we forgive others who sin against us. Go, two go hand in hand. And uh, as we experience forgiveness. But let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you created the way for us to be abundantly free. Help us to grasp this truth better. You thought of everything we need. You provided everything we need. You know what we individually need. And what we individually need to do. Equip us and strengthen us. With your Holy Spirit, we pray. And where we seem to be in a prison of unforgiveness, or where we wish to hold others in a prison of unforgiveness, we ask that you forgive us and we can share your forgiveness and we can be abundantly free. And our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.